exploration of the nature of the square root of two by Terence Howard. Just as the symbol two signifies the combination one plus one, the symbol for the square root of two satisfies the equation x times x equals two. Now on a larger scale, the history of numbers has largely been the journey from concrete reality into the imagination. Does this equation have a solution? Can it? We have repeated this cycle in our passage from the natural numbers to the integers, introducing negative integers. In our passage from natural numbers to positive rationals, introducing ratios. In our passage from rational numbers to algebraic numbers, introducing roots. In our passage from algebraic numbers to real numbers, introducing limits. And in our passage from real numbers to complex numbers, where we introduce solutions to the equation x times x equals negative one. Now, so great is history's momentum that we take these number systems as universal truth. Why? Indeed, any mathematician with an understanding of category theory and abstract algebra would object to the special emphasis placed on these particular systems. They are useful in some applications, I will say, but they are fallaciously applied to all situations. If you would but open your eyes, never again would they close. And society's strict adherence to the artifacts of number history strikes the enlightened as rather suspicious. So how did the square root of two come about? Well, we must journey to the time of Pythagoras and his followers. Flat geometry was beginning to sprout in Western minds. And of particular importance was the right triangle, a triangle with orthogonal edges meeting at a right angle. What we now call the Pythagorean theorem was being explored and a simple situation was laid out. Consider a square with sides of unit length. If its sides are of length one, then what is the length from one corner to an opposite corner? The Pythagorean theorem states that this diagonal D should satisfy the equation D times D equals one times one plus one times one. Now here we see the genesis of defect, an assumption that would be ignored for thousands of years. In trying to solve this equation to find the value of D, the value of one times one was taken to be one. But what of the unit that I previously called length? The products of a unit length with another unit length must have units of area, correct? A choice was made and then taken to be arbitrary. This could not be farther from the truth. So let's see what's happened here. Now it would help us to use modern language. And in that, credit should be given to the great Herman Grassmann. This man worked to clarify the assumptions and language of the physicist of his day. And by his contemplations, multilinear algebra arose. And in laying the foundations for this formal system, he was the first to contrast the algebra of linear spaces 
and so also the first to suggest nonlinear algebra. Today, Grossman's work is called geometric algebra. It has become a mainstay in modern physical theories, and only recently have people begun moving outside of the boundaries exposed by this brilliant soul. You see, Grassman recognized that vectors cannot be multiplied naturally or canonically. A choice must be made to equip the vector space with the structure of an algebra. Had the Pythagoreans accessed this perspective, they would have realized that one length may be an area of any chosen unit. Sure, setting this product to be one unit of area seems natural, but this is only because we have grown accustomed to this convention. Studying the universal properties of Grassmann's algebras, alternating tensor algebras, and Clifford algebras, these all being categorical quotients of freely generated tensor algebras illuminates the student and reveals the great deception that we have allowed ourselves to slip into. And whether this series of events was orchestrated or malignant is for others to determine, but I can speak with certainty on the status of our numeral and coordinate algebras. They are curious artifacts, and we are ants toying with scraps of the logos. If the square root of 2 satisfies x squared equals x times x, which equals 2, then our arithmetic conventions allows us to simply write it as 2 to the 1 half. Now, in this way, 2 to the 1 half squared is equal to 2 to the 1 half times 2, which is equal to 2 to 2 over 2, which is also equal to 2 to the 1, which also equals 2. Thus, 2 to the 1 half cubed is equal to 2 to the 3 half which is equal to 2 to 1 plus 1 half, which is equal to 2 times 2 to the 1 half. Now the cube of the square root of 2 is equal to twice the square root of 2. That is to say, the square root of 2 is also a solution to the equation. x cubed is equal to x plus x, which is equal to 2 times x. Such equations are unnatural, and our investigations of the cosmos will dissipate so long as we project this archaic system upon it. Ultimately, what is being said, and we will check it with our calculators and our smartphones and our computers in just a moment, just to see if this is really true. Based on this simple algebra, the square root of 2, when cubed, will have the same exact value as the square root of 2 times 2. What in the world? Now you show me one place in the history of existence where an individual number, the square root of a given number, multiplied by two has the same value as that number cubed. And then if you divide it by two, the square root of two cubed, you divide that by two, cube it again, and divide by 2 and cube it again. I did that one night 216 times, and by the 216th time, you know what I came up to? After I took the square root of 2, which is 1.414213562373095, and I cubed that, I got 2.828427121746190. The 216th time that I did that cycle. Now, any other number 
from 2.1 to 1.9, whether above 2 or below 2, by the seventh cycle, I was already at an exponentially high number, so high that the computer could no longer show me its digits. Or if it was below 2 at 1.9999, I was already at an exponentially low number that the computer screen no longer could carry. But this square root of 2, cubed or multiplied by 2, continued to say the same no matter what condition was pressed upon it. That is a loop. That is an unnatural number. It does not allow for the expansion and contraction of the universe. It is a mathematical fallacy, and unfortunately, most of quantum physics and quantum mechanics have their basis, their foundation rested in this number. I think it's time to do an audit. Thank you.